in. Uh, it is a difficult room to find, so hopefully uh, a few more people will come in as the uh, afternoon progresses. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Penelope Figgis, commonly known as Penny. I am the National Director of the, of the Australian Committee for IUCN, and I'm also the Vice Chair for Oceania of the World Commission on Protected Areas, and a lifelong lover of World Heritage Areas. Uh, first of all, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional people of Jeju Island and express my respect for their very distinctive culture. 40th anniversaries, all uh, birthday parties, if you like, with an O on the end, are a time for reflection and thought. 40 is particularly daunting, though unfortunately it's a while ago. Um, and I'll tell you what, the ones after that get even more daunting. So each one with an O on the end is a, is a moment to think and pause and to, to celebrate all the good things you've done in your life, but work out where you are and what you are still want to do and what can be improved in your life. So I guess the World Heritage Convention is at exactly that point. We are celebrating a great deal of outstanding uh, contributions to the world's conservation regimes uh, of these outstanding places. And in my country alone, uh, it's not an exaggeration to say that World Heritage has defined the environmental history of Australia over the last 20 years. Uh, so, but it's time to take stock, look at these challenges, the failures, and see if we can improve them. IUCN obviously has a special role that we're very aware of, the, the, uh, the formal advisory body to natural heritage, and therefore we have a particular responsibility. Uh, it'll become clear uh, in the discussion today, however, that there are concerns out there that at the 40 years, despite all the celebration, there are some real concerns out there that go to the heart of what it actually means. Is it a badge? Is it a, a beauty contest? Uh, or does it really mean something? Do we really mean it when we say that these are the special areas of the earth that we will pass on to the next generation in, uh, in their arts and protect their outstanding universal value? The problems are multifaceted and we'll hear from our outstanding lineup of speakers about what some of those problems are. Uh, it besets even well-managed sites. Uh, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia is regarded as the best managed reef in the world and yet we cannot uh, even say that is safe because we are uh, the World Heritage, uh, sorry, the World Heritage area in itself is surrounded by an area where there is massive development and uh, a quite extraordinary expansion of resource extraction. Okay, many of these issues were identified in UNESCO's, uh, in by UNESCO's independent auditor auditors, as you know, and are, are being to some degree uh, addressed. So, um, we do have, I wanted to make something clear, we do have motion 53 that uh, all of you would be aware of. That will become, after it's debated, uh, the formal position of IUCN. So today we're not trying to wordsmith that uh, or even uh, break it down into too many components. Our outcome today that we're looking for is a higher level, if you like, a more informal from this gathering of people distillation of a few key messages, if you like headline messages, that we would like to be able to hand over to Julia martin Lefebvre when she has a high-level meeting quite soon in Paris, which has been called because of some of the concerns we're going to be discussing. It will be something that will be useful uh, for Tim in his work as heading our world, uh, IUCN's World Heritage Unit. It will be useful at the celebratory meeting at the end of the year in Japan. Uh, in Kyoto. So we're looking at those sort of high level, high level uh, messages which we will try and distill in a discussion at the end. Um, I'm just going to see if there are any key points. So while you're listening to the speakers, if you, if you do jot down some uh, core thoughts, uh, either about the way we, uh, how World Heritage Areas are created, the uh, indicative lists or the nomination process, what happens when they get to the World Heritage Committee? What happens then? 
uh, and whether that process is as robust as it should be, and perhaps then once they're declared, what happens then? Do we manage them in the way in which all of us believe they should be managed as the absolute flagships of protected areas on Earth? And then what are some of the other issues? I know there are concerns out there that we must I I ensure that uh, the people who live there, the indigenous people, uh, are, that they are, their rights, uh, their involvement is properly taken care of and incorporated. Okay, that will do from me. I simply wanted to say at the heart of what we're trying to do this afternoon is we are trying to keep the outstanding exceptional for all time. So I will introduce my first speaker who has written his own blurb and, oops, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that's you, Guy. And I thought you were speaking before. No, no, I'm sorry. No. My apologies. Um, Guy de Bonnet is the chief of the Special Projects Unit at the UNESCO World Heritage Centre. And he's also the senior nature specialist at the centre. And he has a background in field conservation in Africa and other countries. So please welcome Guy de Bonnet. Okay, thank you very much, Hani, for introducing this uh, in a very eloquent way. And uh, thank you all for having, uh, for participating at this uh, short workshop, which I think is a great opportunity to reflect on the World Heritage Convention at its 40th anniversary, and also is a great opportunity for uh, IUCN and its members to give some message to the World Heritage Committee and to the larger World Heritage community out there on what are their views and positions on the World Heritage Convention. I want to just uh, br uh, use this 10 minutes to briefly speak about some of the achievements but also some of the challenges that we see at, in the World Heritage Convention at its 40th anniversary. First of all, I think one of the uh, big achievements is that uh, the World Heritage Convention really has become a global instrument. Today we have 189 countries that have ratified the convention, the state parties. And so it's almost universal convention if we just compare it to our sister conventions in the, in the uh, in, uh, biodiversity world. We have the Ramsar Convention with 163, CMS 117, CITES 175, CBD is doing better 193, but they don't have the US. So it is really a, a, a become a global convention, which uh, also has now 962 sites inscribed on the World Heritage List in 157 countries. So a lot of the countries that are member to the convention, state party to the convention, also have in the meantime sites inscribed uh, on the World Heritage List, including 188 purely natural sites and 29 mixed sites. And this is just a representation of where we can find these sites over the world. A big concentration on the cultural part in Europe, but if you look at the green sites, the, the natural sites, a quite balanced distribution over the world. In terms of the, the convention and protected areas, uh, we have to see that the convention has become a very important international uh, designation for protected areas. If you look at the total uh, uh, surface of protected areas, we're talking about about 21 million square kilometers in the world, 12.7% of the land surface and 7.2% of the territorial waters. Mm -hmm. If we compare that to the world's heritage sites, the two, we have now 218 sites, but just before the last committee we had 211 natural sites on the list and they cover 2.66 million square kilometers. That means that in, in effect 11% of the protected area surface has now a World Heritage status. This is because of course we have some of the largest protected areas inscribed on the World Heritage list. So 11% of the, uh, the protected areas, 25% of the uh, marine protected areas today have low heritage status and 6% of the terrestrial areas. And then you also see the distribution in the different uh, regions. So these are some important achievements. Today a significant part of the protected area state 
has this World Heritage status, which, is, which give them an, an international uh, designation and also which give them an international legal protection through the convention. And there still is great interest from the state parties to nominate new sites. There is also more and more support to uh, uh, prepare nominations, also in the countries that sometimes have more difficulties in uh, having the, the means to prepare these nominations. And if you look at the last uh, uh, couple of years, we see that we have uh, important progress in terms of the inscription of marine sites. We had some uh, very big marine sites inscribed over the last couple of years, like Phoenix Islands, Papahanamukuakea, or the Rock Island Southern Lagoon in Palau this year. Some of the important gaps that have been uh, identified in some of the IUCN analysis have been uh, uh, filled in the meantime, like the Madagascar rainforest or the Western Ghats, and other uh, uh, nomination efforts are on the way for some of these gaps, like the Namib Desert and the Okavango. And also we see more and more transboundary sites, like this year we had the inscription of Sangha Tree National, which is the first three national site to be inscribed um, in Africa, a natural site uh, on the World Heritage List. At the same time, we also see some challenges because more and more um, the committee is not always following the recommendations of IUCN in its evaluation. Uh, and sometimes sites get inscribed before IUCN considers them ready. Uh, often this, this is about sites that do have the, the, the values that where, where the arts and the universal value is recognized but where IUCN sees deficiencies in terms of protection and management which need to be addressed. And the fact that uh, these sites are uh, inscribed uh, a bit prematurely also means that they uh, come up more quickly in the state of conservation uh, reporting. Another very important uh, element of the World Heritage Convention is that it's not just about inscription and then we forget about the sites. No, the, the convention also has a very um, uh, well-oiled mechanism to monitor the sites once they have inscribed. Every year, IUCN and the World Heritage Center uh, report to the World Heritage Committee on the state of conservation of sites that have been inscribed, and this is just the figures of the number of reports we presented to the committee on the natural sites over the last uh, couple of years. So we can see fi around 50 reports a year, so that means we report on about one-fourth of the sites every year to the committee. And each of these reports are accompanied by a decision which is adopted by the committee and which has very clear uh, indications or uh, requests to the government to address conservation issues in these sites. One of the tools of the in, in, in terms of the state of conservation uh, monitoring is the reactive monitoring missions. Approximately 15 missions a year are organized and called for. And these are really excellent opportunities for uh, IUCN and the World Heritage Center to visit the sites and to discuss with the people managing the sites on the concrete conservation issues and how they can be addressed. And of course we have the list of World Heritage in Danger. Currently we have 17 natural sites inscribed on the list of World Heritage in Danger. Uh, and you can immediately see 12 of these 17 are situated in Africa. But also we have to recognize that actually more sites than these 17 meet the conditions for inscription of the, on the list of World Heritage in Danger. And sometimes the political decision-making process of the committee does not allow uh, for the sites to be inscribed, although they meet these criteria. So the achievements, I think we can say that uh, we have a state of conservation report uh, monitoring process which enables the international monitoring of the World Heritage Sites and I think we can, it's fair to say that this process has become more effective over the, the, the last 10 years. Um, also with IUCN uh, reaching out more to its members to get information on the sites, uh, on the state of conservation of the sites. And through this reporting system we have been able to contribute to addressing some of the uh, serious development threats in certain properties and also have been able to uh, follow up on the, the management in certain sites. Also the World Heritage status is uh, taken increasingly serious by other uh, stakeholders like the extractive industries which uh, led to the famous no-go commitments by ICMM and Shell. Just uh, quickly uh, some of the examples of the, the concrete conservation achievements Lake Baikal where a couple of years ago there was a plan for a pipeline to be built very close to the, the lake, it's the, the arrow uh, down uh, in the slide. The pipeline was supposed to pass uh, a couple of kilometers from the lake. 
uh, and um, uh, after decisions by the committee and after a lot of pressure from the international community, uh, Russia decided to move the pipeline uh, several hundred kilometers north of the lake. A more recent example is uh, Serengeti National Park, where there was discussion of a road which would go through the northern part of the, the site. And uh, at the committee uh, <coughs> two years ago, the, last year, the, the State Party of Tanzania made a commitment not to construct this road through the uh, northern part of uh, Serengeti National Park. A good example of a site that has been facing conflict has been Manas National Park, where we had a real serious uh, depletion of the wildlife populations as a result of the conflict situation there, and where um, through the danger listing uh, it was possible to bring back some of the animals, including the, the rhinos, which had uh, completely disappeared from the site. And so uh, last year the site was. Uh, taken off the danger list because basically the wildlife population, the restoration of the wildlife populations is now well underway. So clearly there are some challenges too because in spite of the, the good reactive monitoring process, I think still certain issues do not get on the radar screen of IUCN on the World Heritage Center. And clearly we can see a trend that over the last couple of years the developmental pressures are on the increase. We see more and more sites that are confronted with uh, projects of mining, oil and gas, dam, infrastructure, and other types of infrastructure. Conflict situations also remain a serious uh, problem for many sites. And also we have to recognize that uh, World Heritage sites, they should not only be the most important sites, but also the best managed sites. And we are very far from uh, reaching that, uh, that uh, threshold. Many remain understaffed and underfunded, and in fact, Many more should be inscribed on the, on the list in danger if we would really uh, apply the criteria uh, rigorously. Just some examples of these challenges. Oil, we have uh, uh, to the left uh, uh, Virunga National Park where there is uh, discussion of oil exploration in the park. The right hand side shows oil exploration licenses around the Belize Barrier Reef. Dams are an increasing uh, issue and sometimes these dams can be far away from the, the property and create uh, new types of challenges like Lake Turkana where the dam is basically uh, far away in Ethiopia and so there is issues on, on, on the uh, responsibility of Ethiopia towards the conservation of this site. Mining, this is an example of JA where you can see the different mining uh, uh, exploration concessions that has been given inside and sometimes even in, inside, inside and around the, the protected area. Uh, conflict, uh, you must have uh, heard about the terrible events in Okapi Wildlife Reserve in July this year, where there was uh, an attack on the station and uh, all the Okapi of the breeding st station were killed. Or climate change, many, many sites are of course impacted uh, on different impacts from climate change like Mount Kenya, Sundarbans, mm -hmm. or the Cape Flora region. So all of these challenges uh, uh, are to be reflected on in the, in the 40th anniversary. One it, what, it's, what is quite interesting is that there was a recent audit, which was also mentioned, um, about the, the World Heritage Convention and the implementation of the global strategy. And this audit, which was done by the French um, um, Cour des Comptes, uh, uh, looked at it for really from an outsider point of view and came to some conclusions in terms of a worrying evolution uh, on the credibility of the list with the increasing diver divergences between the committee decisions and the recommendations of the advisory bodies, the need to ensure a strict observation of the OUV as a criterion for inscription on the list in order to ensure this credibility of the list, the need to restore, to put this convention, to put conservation back at the, conven at the heart of this convention and not make it just a listing convention, the need to encourage uh, local community involvement and the need to reflect on the wider objectives of heritage conservation of the convention. So in conclusion, I think we have some great achievements in these 40 years, but also some great challenges. We have an, uh, the convention presents with a great opportunity because we have an universal legal instrument which provides a international protection status to a large part of our most valuable protected areas. The convention has a monitoring system which is functional but could of course be further improved. There is a challenge in, in terms of the decision making in the convention which is more and more influenced by politics and not based on expert advice. And 
we have to recognize that in spite of the fact that World Heritage is the highest international status for protected areas, this doesn't guarantee that they are uh, sheltered from inappropriate developments or even properly managed and funded. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Guy. I think that sets the scene very well with an absolute overview of both the achievements but the very, very considerable challenges that are faced. So it's my pleasure to introduce Tim Badman, who will be known to most people in the room. Tim, of course, is the director of IUCN World Heritage Program and he's actually worked in IUCN in World Heritage for the last five years. And he was previously the manager of the Dorset and East Devon Coast World Heritage Site in the UK. So he's worked both in policy and certainly on the ground. He has a professional background in coastal zone management. And he is going to speak to us on the World Heritage Convention uh, program. So thanks very much, Tim. Please welcome him. Okay, well, thank, thanks, Benny. Just let me get my slideshow in order here. Okay, so thanks very much, uh, Penny, for the introduction, Guy, for really setting out the, the stall, and to all of you for um, for being here. <coughs> um, what I'd like.